Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Stephanie Fassler, and I am the International Affairs Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this Author Series and World Affairs Today program. In January 2003, the United States led a coalition to overthrow Saddam Hussein, President of Iraq. After the fall of Saddam, the United States and its allies attempted to install a democratic, stable government. However, sectarian violence plagued the country, and the promise of a peaceful life failed to materialize for many of Iraq's people. The Islamic extremist group, the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant, now occupies large areas of the country, imposing harsh law and order, perpetrating mass killings and abductions. How has it all gone so wrong in Iraq? To discuss this with us this evening is Emma Skye, author of The Unraveling, High Hopes and Missed Opportunities in Iraq. Emma Skye has worked in the Middle East for over 20 years including in Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, and the Palestinian territories. Her experience, among many, has been in providing technical assistance with conflict resolution, poverty elimination, and public administration reform. In 2003, she became a representative of the Coalition Provisional Authority in Kirkuk. She served as a political advisor from 2007 to 2010, to now Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army, General Ray Odierno when he was the then commanding general of the multinational corps in Iraq. Her articles have been published in Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and with the United States Institute for Peace and the Center for American Strategy. She has held fellowships and been a visiting professor at a number of places, including King's College War Studies Department, Oxford University, and Harvard University. Ms. Skye is currently a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute where she lectures on the new Iraq and Middle East politics. Joining Ms. Skye is Ambassador Ronald Newman. Ambassador Newman is the president of the American Academy of Diplomacy. He has served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Near East Affairs and is Ambassador to Bahrain, Algeria, and retiring in 2007 after serving as Ambassador to Afghanistan. Prior to that final assignment, he was stationed in Baghdad from February 2004 with the Coalition Provisional Authority and then, and then as the U.S. Embassy's principal liaison with the Multinational Command. Ambassador Newman also shares the distinction of him and his father serving in the same country as ambassador, not at the same time, which has not been done since John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. I thought we might just start tonight's conversation by you talking just a little bit about how, you know, a nice young woman of humanistic instincts and background working in the Palestinian territories for peace became the, uh, the significant political advisor to the U.S. military, first in Kirkuk and then in Baghdad. Well, it is a bit of an unlikely story, I have to admit. So I was very much against the war. And the British government asked for volunteers to come and administer Iraq for three months before we handed the country back to the Iraqi people. They just said it's three months before we hand it back. And I thought this is a great opportunity for me to go out to Iraq to apologize to Iraqis for the war. So as you said, I've been working in the Palestinian territories. I'd got some experience in capacity building, institutional development, conflict mediation. So I thought, I could usefully do something. So I volunteered. That'll teach you. <laughs> Three months, that's all it was supposed to be. And the only instructions I got were from the British government. I had one phone call that was, um, go to RAF Bryce Norton, it's Royal Air Force Base. Get on a plane to Basra. When you arrive, you'll be met with somebody carrying a sign with your name on it and taken to the nearest hotel. 
well, it's the British government. I assumed that they knew what they were doing. I assume they must have a job for me, but they just hadn't mentioned it for some reason. But that was instructions I was given. So off I went. I got to the RAF base, managed to get on this plane full of soldiers, got to Basra. And there wasn't anybody expecting me, so there was no sign with my name on it. And I thought, you know, what am I supposed to do? So there was this big C-130 going up to Baghdad the next day. So I got a ride on that, and I went to the palace in Baghdad. And I turned up. This was now Coalition Provisional Authority headquarters. I said, hello, I'm a volunteer from Britain, come to help. And they said, well, we've got enough people here at the moment. Um, try the north. <laughs> so I thought, oh, right. So I got another plane, I went up to Mosul. And in Mosul, they said, oh, no, we've got somebody here, keep going. <laughs> so I went to Erbil. And then they said, you should go to Kirkuk. I don't think we've got anybody in Kirkuk. So I go to Kirkuk. And I arrive, and they say, great. You are now Ambassador Bremer's representative. You are the government coordinator of Kirkuk. And I just thought, this is bizarre. This is really bizarre. I hadn't come out to be a colonial administrator. Now I'm put in charge of a province. But it was only supposed to be for three months. Well, during my first week, in my big job, rather embarrassed about this job, in my first week, one night insurgents come to the front door of the house and with their rockets, they attack the house. So I was very fortunate to survive that, but the house was less fortunate. And so I went the next day, I thought I'd better find out, you know, I need somewhere to stay. So I tracked down the colonel who was in charge of the province. So he was Colonel Mavel, and he was the brigade commander of the 173rd Airborne Brigade. And he was sitting in the governor's office, the government building, with his feet up on the table. And I came to see him and I said, you know, hello, my name's Emma. Slightly embarrassed because my house has been blown up. Um, look a bit awkward. Do you have anywhere I can stay? Is there a tent or somewhere I could stay on the airfield? And his response was, you know, we're going to track down these people. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm just looking for somewhere to stay. They were attacking me because I'm a symbol of an illegal occupation. It's not personal. They don't know me yet. Anyway, so I thought, how? I mean, this guy, he said he could offer me a tent, but I was more worried about what he was going to do with the people who attacked me. So I turned up to see him the next day, and I brought with me, I got my laptop, and on it I had the Fourth Geneva Convention. And I sat there, sat him next to me, and I read it to him line by line, and I said, if you find you violating any of these articles, I'm going to take you to The Hague. This was early days. I didn't know Americans couldn't be taken to The Hague, or they didn't recognize the International Criminal Court. Found that out later. <laughs> so this wasn't the most auspicious of initial meetings. And yet, over time, you developed phenomenal rapport with the American military, <laughs> this nice little girl from Britain, with this monstrous, bald-headed, massive General Odierno and the powerhouse General Petraeus. And they kept asking you to come back and be their principal political advisor. And so I thought it would be interesting to know you, you've gone through a certain metamorphosis in your life here. And by the way, what you just heard, in case you thought this was a unique or original, you know, unusual story. What you just heard is a microcosm of the early part of the occupation of Iraq and how pretty much everything worked. Um, people pouring in, pouring out. Uh, I was lucky I didn't get there till February of 2004. It, it was marginally better than when Emma arrived because we had indoor toilets by that time, at least in the office, not at the uh, outside. And, masses of, uh, we had computers, sort of. Uh, I remember masses of cable being run through the building, all duct taped together. I mean, it would have been a occupation and safety hazard inspector would have arrived with an entire container load of forms and been busy for a lifetime. But uh, it was marginally better than when you got there. And obviously, got a lot more popular with our military, even though you never stopped arguing with them. But just what I'd like to ask you to sort of take just a few minutes, because I do want to get to the more political part, but 
sort to reflect on what you, how you came to view the, you know, the better side of the American military. Uh, I mean, better in terms of the kind of people and how you, what you discovered, and you know, sort of how you came to, to view them. Well, as I said, my first encounter, I was full of my own baggage that I brought with me, and so this all lived up to my expectations. But I found, you know, this tremendous energy. They really wanted to do the right thing. They didn't know how or what they should be doing because there was no guidance coming down. But they were absolutely dedicated. So I'd look around the government building, and you had all these U.S. soldiers were running everything. You know, they're like, man, we've delivered X amount of, you know, water or X amount of schools have been open, and it was all about them. So I said, look, success is not you guys doing stuff. It's the Iraqis doing stuff. You've got to get the Iraqis running their country again. They've been running their country for decades. Now we've taken it. We've got to give it back. And so they're like, ma'am, you're right. We've got to put an Iraqi between us and the problem. I thought, OK, that's one way of thinking about it. And so I realized they really wanted to do the right thing, and they were open to ideas. In the end, the colonel said to me, he said, look, you understand how to do this much better than we do. How about I assign 100 or so of my staff to work with you? And so we built this team of the civilians working there and of the military working there. We called it team government, and how we could help the Iraqis get their country back on its feet. And I was just amazed. I mean, these guys had got like not one degree, they had like two degrees, and some of them from Harvard. And why do you need a degree from Harvard to be in the military? So it's like, oh my God. You know, it's like, wow. There's much more to them than I expected. I couldn't understand why anybody in their right mind with the choice of careers ahead of them would join the military. I'm like, why would you go to the other side of the world to fight people who are no threat to you? And so the more I thought, you know, I've got to stop projecting my ideas onto them. I've got to listen to them and understand how they see themselves. And so I got to hear of all these stories of you know, self-improvement, of what they gained from being in the army, the education they'd received, how much they loved it as an institution. They felt it looked after them. They felt very dedicated to what they were doing. And they were idealistic, very idealistic. They really, really wanted to do the right thing. So I look back at those early days, and I'm still very good friends with the soldiers I served with there. And I, you know, we fought all the time. And I think they liked having somebody with my accent telling them when they were screwing up. I think that was part of the appeal. But you know, we became very, very close. We were in this situation together, and we wanted to work together to improve the situation for the sake of the Iraqis. And I found, you know, much to my shock, I found myself really enjoying working with them. I found their organization, once you learn how to work with it, it's, you know, they've got good leadership skills, they've got resources. And I thought the best contribution I can make during my time in Iraq is helping the military do better, helping them do things better. And so General Odiana was the boss of this colonel. And every time he came down to Kirkuk, he'd have all the army sitting there, and then there would be me. And, you know, he thought it's a bit odd, I think, at the beginning, but he asked me a question. and then asked me another question, and he asked, just kept asking questions. And I thought, you know, when you look at him, he's a little bit, you know, he's a bit big. <laughs> and he's, he's a bit more, scary he's more than looking. a bit big. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he looks like a different species. I had never seen a human being of that size. <laughs> and so I was like, whoa. <laughs> and, you know, he just kept asking question after question after question. And so I realized, you know, he'd been focused on fighting the war. Nobody had asked him to think about the day after. And, you know, when you wind forward a few years later, I left Iraq in 2004. A few years later, I get this email from him out of the blue. It's like, Emma, I'm going back to Iraq, surging. Will you come and be my political advisor? And I thought, let's pretend this email went to the junk box <laughs> so I won't respond. Well, these guys have lots of people working for them, and they'll be like, ma'am, the general sent you an email an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> and then there'd be sort of photos. I was living in London. I'd just been in Afghanistan. I finished my tour of Afghanistan. I got back to London. 
and they found my house on Google Earth, so it'd be a photo of my house in London with these rockets pointing at it, you know. <laughs> respond to the general. So I had to respond to him. And I went back out to Iraq as his political advisor. And I thought, you know, what does he want me to do? And he was very honest. You know, he sat down and he said, look, I need somebody to tell me when I'm screwing up. He said, you've got a completely different perspective. I want you to come everywhere with me and just give me your perspective. I thought, well, that's a very nice job to have. Normally, I've got to, like, bite my tongue and be politically correct. And he wants you me to couldn't. say exactly what I think. Oh, that might suit me. <laughs> I think it says extraordinary things about him because people normally, they say you must surround yourselves by people who are different than you, but people very rarely do. And you really don't get anybody more different than General Odieno and myself. He likes football. He drinks beer. He likes burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Our worlds would never have crossed if it hadn't been for Iraq. We have nothing in common. Except and now a deep friendship. And now we have this whole experience together. But at the beginning, you think, how can people see things so differently? And, you know, it really was extraordinary. So everywhere he went, he took me with him to be out visiting all the troops, out to the front line of battle, in the meetings of all the Iraqis, and I would be this permanent fixture, not at his side. I'd be about a step behind, a lot <laughs> shorter but always there with him. And before the meetings, we would discuss the meetings. Afterwards, we would debrief, what did you think? What do you reckon? How should we take this forward? And it was an incredible experience. Let me, if I may, move you a little more into the politics. And for those of you who have or will acquire Emma's book, you'll, you'll find a lot, of, uh, a, a lot in there of profound reflection on how we did and didn't do things, and I commend it to you. Uh, let me pick two periods to talk about before we go to questions. One is the period of the coalition provisional authority. And this has been picked over a great deal. And it's people tend to boil it down so that it becomes uh, sort of, well, you really just made these, you know, you made these huge mistakes, which I think we all agree we did, of disbanding the army and the debathification and the way it was followed up. But that period gets picked over endlessly from the military side in those two mistakes. Much less gets written about the, the coalition provisional authority, the CPA period, in terms of the politics what worked and what didn't work. And I grant you that could be a lecture for the whole evening. But where would you pick out sort of a few key points that made it very difficult to go back and do it better? I think one of the biggest errors made, and it was early on, was the way in which the governing council was established. There were some within the US system who just wanted to put Chalabi in charge and get out. This is the Iraqi coalition that became our, our advisors and then the government sort of thing. Yeah. And there were some who said, Iraqis aren't ready to govern. We need to govern them. And the compromise was to set up this Iraqi governing council of 25 members. But the way that we set this up, we assigned posts based on sect and ethnicity. And we particularly privileged those who were exiles who were returning. And they were, a lot of them were Islamists. So this idea that it was done to try and create a pluralistic Iraq, but what it did was it institutionalized sectarianism. So people who identified as secular or liberal, they then had to be identified by sect and ethnicity. And this then permeated down all the institutions. So rather than building up Iraq, it all became about sect and ethnicity. Yeah. Now, how would you have avoided that? I mean, there was a concept early on that we were going to have local elections, and the local elections were going to generate up uh, through a couple of phases, and that was how we were going to send people to Iraq. Given the absence of parties and structures, do you think that would have worked if we had carried forward with it, or was there a third way that we never explored? I think we should have 
looked much more for geographical representation. So people to be representatives of the towns in which they lived, of all those people. Iraq has got many mixed communities, and so you need to be the representative of all the community living in that town. And so if we'd set things up by geographical representation... Which is what that provisional, those first elections would have done had we carried forward with If we carried them forward and if we'd had an electoral system that was based on the provinces, based on districting, rather than on country as a whole, which allowed the established militias to basically take control of the whole state. And it squeezed out liberals. And it really meant that those that we'd brought back from exile, many of them were Shia Islamists who'd been on Iran's side in the Iran-Iraq war, they got, very, they got huge amounts of power through this. And those who'd been in Iraq all along, particularly the Sadrists, felt they were being excluded from the new Iraq. And obviously, all of the Sunnis felt that they were being excluded mm -hmm. as well. So I think an approach that had looked much more at geography and not at sect and ethnicity would have created a better governance structure to begin with. And you could then have representatives of each of the cities or the towns then in a council of some sort in the center. It's very hard when you make that sort of mistake to undo it. That, you know, I often rem reflect on a number of these issues that it's not like a college course. If you fail it, you, you don't get to take it over. You, you, go on to yeah. the, you may go on to the graduate course without ever having had the introductory version, but you don't get to do it over again. And it just permeated and, down and, through all the institutions. No. They became fiefdoms or political parties. Well, we, I remember when we and the Iraqis negotiated the transitional law, authority law that became the, the underpinning of the Constitution. And the good news was it was really heavily argued and negotiated within the governing council. It wasn't just an American imposition. The bad news was only 25 people in all of Iraq knew what had happened in there, and nobody else had any understanding of that. Would you, is there anything else to equal? I mean, what else would you put your finger on in terms of so, so much that happened was the building of the sectarian differences that are bedeviling us now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's a whole issue of when do you have elections. We had elections very early in Iraq. And what happened was that people, you know, these people that we had brought in from outside mobilized constituents based on sectarianism. They didn't have any grassroots base. And so populist support, it was always fear of the other using sectarianism. So I think when we held the elections and the electoral system was very problematic, you watch Iraq plunging into civil war after that. So it went down, down, and down. And how the Constitution was done, as you described, it was done by a very small group. It didn't represent consensus. That Constitution was never debated around the country. And each the one that out of the 25, they put their particular articles in, so it's full of contradictions. So I think the Constitution was done too quickly. Elections happened too early. The electoral system wasn't the right system. So it encouraged people to, you know, sector, sectarian entrepreneurs to mobilize people based on fear. I Apart from that. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now I've been very struck though, this is a, you know, if you're gonna talk about lessons from these things, it seems <coughs> to me that one lesson, not just from Iraq, but from Afghanistan, from so many interventions has been our fixation on trying to go too rapidly to elections, which then drive or mo mobilize people to fall back on ethnic, tribal, clan bases, or fear of the other as a mobilizing strategy. It's one of the larger mistakes that we manage to make repeatedly. I want to focus on one other period and then just talk for a minute about where we are now and then we'll go to questions. You talk in your book about the later election that returned Maliki to power when Ayad Alawi's party had actually a narrow majority, not a majority of the parliament, but a narrow plurality of votes. And how in the end we, we the United States particularly, made a very poor decision in backing Maliki. 
and then we paid for that seriously in a government that became very, very ethnically partisan, even more so than it had been before, and more so after we left. How much do you think our position, how much do you think we really had a choice? Uh, because some argue, well, there was no one else. And how much difference might it have made, I recognize that speculative, if we had taken a different position? So I believe there were choices and different positions that could have been taken. So as it's described with those first elections, which really led to you know, exacerbated tensions and took Iraq down into civil war. We then had, for two years, we actually had the right policy, the right leadership, and the right resources. That was 2007 to 2009 during the surge. And he started to see everything, all the indicators, all going the right direction. Iraq's trajectory was positive. And the Iraqis felt, and we felt, that at last the worst was behind, and they were going in the right direction. And we saw, as Iraqis went into the 2010 elections, the campaign slogans were really about you know, an end to sectarianism, no to sectarianism. We want to put that behind us, no to religious parties. And in particular, this new bloc came together, Iraqia, led by Ayed Alawi, that really said, you know, we want a vision for Iraq that is non-sectarian. And that vision that he put forward appealed to secular people who happen to be Shia. It appealed to minorities, and it appealed to the Sunnis. And much to everyone's surprise, Iraqi actually went on to win the elections. So parliamentary system, that group that gets the most in the elections is the winner in a parliamentary system and should have the right to have first go at forming the government. <coughs> we didn't actually think that Ayed Alawi could form the government with himself as prime minister, but we thought he had the right to try. So when I say we, this was the position of General Odiano and myself, because there was big disagreements within the US system. So his position, my position was, we should uphold the election results, give the winner first go at trying to form the government, he has 30 days to do it. And we thought that would lead to either a deal between Alawi and Maliki, or Alawi would choose somebody else, a third candidate like Adel Abdel Mehdi, to be the prime minister. Now, it was a new administration, a new ambassador who hadn't got any experience in the region. And they were like, ah, we shouldn't really get involved in helping to form the government. Let the Iraqis you know, do what they do. We want the embassy to be normal. We thought, well, nothing in Iraq is normal. And we've been helping broker agreements between the Iraqis you know, since 2003. We knew from 2008 the Iraqi elites wanted to get rid of Maliki. They had tried time and again to get rid of him through a vote of no confidence in the parliament. And each time we'd intervened and said, look, so much instability in Iraq. Don't do this now. Focus on the other things. The time to get rid of Maliki, if you want to, is in the national elections. So sure enough, in the national elections, people vote, you know, he doesn't win the national elections. And so the elites thought, at last, this is the chance to replace him. But they all agreed they didn't want Maliki. And Iraqis are very good at coming together against what they don't want. They're not so good at coming together about you know, what they do want. So there was no coming together against any, for anybody. They were just coming together against Maliki. And Maliki absolutely refused to believe the election results, sat in his seat and said, you know, the election results are fraudulent. And so there was a recount that proved that the election results were good. And then through debathification, he tried to remove some of Alawi's um, seats and votes. And that didn't work. So then he got the judge to decide that the winner can be either who wins the elections or who forms the largest bloc in parliament. And this just keeps going on and on and on. And I'd been with the general, I'd come to the general two meetings with the ambassador to Maliki. On two occasions, we told him, you can't do it. You know, it's not possible. And then, after everybody, you know, the Ir Iranians have been very busy at this stage. While the Americans weren't doing very much, the Iranians were very busy getting all the Shia leaders over to Tehran to put together a big Shia bloc. And so the Shia bloc comes together, 
but they agree that they don't want Maliki as the prime minister. So it's a block, or it's not a block unless you can agree who your leader is. So it was decided that, well, we thought it was decided that, or the advice given, I should say, to the vice president, Vice President Biden, was to phone up um, Maliki and Alawi and tell them, guys, you've got two weeks to get together and try and reach an agreement, or you should step back and allow a third candidate to try and form the government. But when the vice president got on the phone, that wasn't the message that was delivered. By this stage, he really thought, there's no one but Maliki, and Maliki will give us a follow-on security agreement, and Maliki's our man. You know, he said, I bet my vice presidency Maliki will give us a, a follow-on security agreement. Hmm. And too, bad, so, too bad he didn't follow through them. <laughs> and so when he got on the phone, he said to Maliki, uh, we're supporting you. And when he phoned Alawi, he said, you've got to support Maliki. So this became really problematic because there was no way Alawi was going to support Maliki. He just thought Maliki is causing all these problems. There needs to be change. So that wasn't going to happen. And what happened in the end was that it was the Iranians who pressured the Sadrists to support Maliki. The Sadrists were like, we're not having Maliki again. He attacked us in Basra. We don't like him. But the Iranians, using Lebanese Hezbollah, using all their own instruments, pressured Muqtada. And they said, look, Maliki will ensure that no US troops stay in Iraq beyond 2011. That is the price of a second Maliki term. Of course, the Sadrists wanted that. And the Sadrists were assured that they would get good posts in the future government. So it was, in fact, the Iranians that brokered the government in 2010. And after this had been done, the Americans try and do something up in Erbil to bring in Iraqia and everybody. They had the Erbil agreement, but that was never upheld. It was never guaranteed. And so after that, Maliki determined he would go after his political rivals, he drove Sunnis out of the political process. He arrested the tribal fighters who had been fighting against Al-Qaeda. He reneged on his pledges to integrate people into the security forces. He undermined the judiciary, undermined some of the other watchdog institutions that we had helped establish to monitor the executive. And he just became more and more authoritarian, which created, as a backlash, all these Sunni protests that created the environment that allowed the Islamic State to emerge. Yeah. And now we talk a great deal about how Iraq has to come back together. You know, we're going to go off and bomb regularly, but in the meantime, Iraq is supposed to come back together in some fashion. And the Sunnis have to be brought back into the government, and the Kurds need to be part of this. And we don't have a whole lot of time here for the depth of the answer that you're capable of giving. But what's your guess? Can this really be put back in the box? And if it can't be put back in the box, what is the alternative strategy the West ought to be following if one shares the belief that the Islamic State really is a danger and has to be combated? Well, I think the Islamic State is a symptom of bigger problems in the region. So partly the Iraq war and the way we left Iraq has changed the balance of power in the region in Iran's favor. And this has set off this new level of geopolitical competition between Iran and the Gulf states, which has them supporting these extreme sectarian actors and turning local grievances about poor governance into these regional proxy wars. And so you saw Sunnis looking at Islamic State, Maliki's Iranian-backed discriminatory regime and thinking, oh, maybe ISIS is not so bad. Terrible decision, but that's what was taken. There is no going back now. We are where we are. And so when you look at what potential futures are out there, I think the most optimistic one is confederation between Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan, and then decentralization for the rest of the country, decentralize it down to provincial level. I don't go for the three regions, because then you end up with Sunnis controlling water, Shia controlling oil, 
And where would the borders be? Well, and all the intermixed populations that are then going to fight like crazy with each other. And, and all the couples who are going to have to divorce. 30% yeah, of people were intermarried when we got yeah. to Baghdad. No, I know that that's, that three-part division of the country was another wonderful idea of Vice President Biden's. <laughs> well, now it looks like it's coming true, but I hope it doesn't come true. I hope power can be decentralized down to provincial level and you get much more local governance built up. So you take away that competition from power at the center. And I hope they can diversify the economy away from oil. 95% of the budget comes from oil. Now, it's a problem at the moment because the oil price is so low, but it's also a problem because it crowds out other sectors of the economy. It means the government is living off this easy rent, not people's taxes. And so you don't have this relationship between people and government. Well, I think the moment has come when we should go to a few questions from our audience, because they're here for that. Uh, I obviously find this fascinating to keep you here all night by myself, but I think we should have some deference to the audience now. Please, go ahead. You said part of the problem was that the Constitution and the first elections were done very hastily. Um, at the time, the thinking was that handing power back to the Iraqis in a more credible way would undermine the insurgency. I mean, it, it ended up not undermining the insurgency. Is that an argument that you were trying to make at the time? Um, would there have been any convincing way in which to argue that elections should have been delayed uh, at a time when there was an escalating insurgency against the US? So at the time, there was a UN mission that was sent out to look at various options for the elections. And they came up with, I think, three different options that they then shared with the Iraqis. But it was interesting, I think it was Tom Warwick at the State Department who was really urging for a different electoral system, that he, he predicted that if you do it as the country's one electoral district, you will empower those with guns, and you will squeeze out the secular liberals who don't, aren't able to mobilize in that way. So there was a very, I mean, there was in-depth discussions going on. The State Department was writing cables on this, but in the end, that position wasn't carried. The UN position was that the easiest way was to do it, one electoral district, they said, if you do it by districting, that's going to take longer because we've got to, we haven't had a census, all those things aren't in place. They also feared that if you do it by district, assassinations of individuals have more impact. Or if you do it as the country as a whole, then people don't know who's running, so it has less impact. So many times in Iraq, it's not like no ideas, other ideas were on the table. At all these various stages, there were many other different options put forward. And you know, sometimes you look at it and you think, gosh, at every stage, did we just choose the bad option? And you know, it can look like that with hindsight, but at the time, there's always good reasons why specific options were taken. I mean, look right at the beginning with Orha, with Jay Garner, who wanted to hand the country over to the Iraqis immediately. And when Bremer came in, he was like, which Iraqis? And Bremer probably wanted to keep CPA going, I think, probably for about two years. But it was Ayatollah Sistani who was very suspicious of this, who really wanted there to be democratic elections. So often you have you know, an instinct to do things quickly to show results, and yet there's a downside to this. And the downside, it took Iraq years to recover from that election. So only by 2010 it had recovered and people had a clear idea of what they want. And then that whole election got undermined, which led to people losing faith in the political system. In the book, it describes you know, discussions I got with Vice President Biden saying to him, look, you know, in a nascent democracy, you have to show people that change comes about through politics. If you have elections and there's no change, then people will lose faith in this system would encourage people to give up violence, to come out of the insurgency, to go into elections. But his response was, you know, in America we have elections and sometimes there's no change. Well, this is not America. 
This is very different circumstance. And you can't just keep the prime minister and the president in place. You've got to show some sort of change. But he disagreed. You know, it, it's also worth remembering, let, lest we be too hard on ourselves, although that's pretty fair, um, that the Sunnis made a disastrous mistake in not participating in that first election. And I was part of a lot of conversations with them. I think you were too. And we were, Robert Ford was, and we were urging them on the, the necessity of their participating. And the Sunni community was riven by uh, factions, tribal groups, they, in a sense, were almost the flip side, where the Shia were very strongly organized in several major groups like uh, Dawa and uh, Mokhtar al Sadr's group. The, the Sunnis weren't organized at all. And so they constantly looked over their shoulder. I mean, the leadership was constantly looking over the shoulder at all the other leaders to see if they looked too accommodationist and who would raise the bidding if they participated. And so in the end, they, the vast majority of Sunnis did not mm -hmm. vote. And I think in, you know, having spent most of my life in the Middle East, I have never seen a whole group decide so quickly that they had screwed up. I would say there was a huge majority within probably three months that said this was a disastrous mistake we made mm -hmm. in not voting. Um, and, and I think that did impel them to vote more in the next election. But it, it is, I think, useful to remember that in making mistakes, we had lots of help. Oh, there is no shortage. <laughs> I mean, Iraq, when you look at Iraq over the last, last decade, it is characterized by the lack of Iraqi statesmen, by really inadequate politicians who've just followed or just tried to sort of extract as much money from the state as they can. They've pursued their own narrow interests. It's hard to talk of a statesman in Iraq. So this has been one of the tragedies of the country post-2003. Do we have another question? Iraq has been going through profound changes. Uh, the Ba'ath Party is gone. The Sykes-Ficot borders have gone. The, uh, I guess Iraqi asserting their independence. And um, against all that, uh, you know, Lord Keynes used to say that in the short run, the politics determines the economics, but in the long run, the economics determine the politics. So could you say a few words in favor of the Iraqi economy? Uh, to what extent it's affecting the, the power struggle and what, what is the future of Iraq as an independent economy? Well, Iraq's economy is totally dependent on oil. And this is part of the problem because it's, you know, when you, Iraq suffers from all the characteristics of the oil curse, the rentier economy, that the incentives are negative incentives on the behavior of the elites. So I think until Iraq diversifies away from oil, it is going to be plagued with these problems. That this struggle for the control of this money, it is easy money, it is easy cash. And this easy money, this easy cash has not been invested in the long-term good of the country. It has been stolen. The elites almost function like a kleptocracy, taking the wealth of the country for themselves. It's not being invested in the country. And I think I was quite slow to recognize the impact of the economy on the political behavior of the elites. But since I left Iraq and get more distance from it, I think it has huge influence on that. And Iraq is blessed that it has oil and water. So the potential for agriculture, all of that is there. There's infrastructure, you know, needs repair. It's not an enabling environment for the economy at all. But with vision, you know, with, with vision, it is possible to think of how Iraq could have a thriving economy. But at the moment, the whole focus now again is once more on the security and not on economic development. But you see in Kurdistan, things are blooming. And down in Basra, Karbala, there is progress. It's private sector led, but there is progress. 
Sir, please. You were speaking of the Kurds, and that was something I wanted to follow up on at this time as well. And uh, first of all, I, it was my impression that uh, in 2010, 2011, that the administration was pressuring the Kurds into supporting Maliki as well. Of course, they regretted that, but uh, I think that's the case. Do, did you disagree on that? Yes, I mean, after it was decided to support Maliki, Mm -hmm. Then pressure was put on everybody to support Maliki. Okay. President Balzani was like, this man is a dangerous man. He's going to destroy Iraq. For President Balzani, he saw the greatest threat was actually central government. So he was very vociferous in warning the U.S. about supporting Maliki. Okay. Well, in the meantime now, the Kurds have taken control in Kirkuk. And uh, they are selling Kirkuk oil, which Baghdad is not benefiting from and Baghdad has cut off the allocation uh, for Kirkuk. Uh, how do you see that situation developing? Kirkuk has been, you know, it's a highly contested province. Yeah. And this is not new. This has been going on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. This is what led to the Ba'ath Party policy of expelling Kurds and Turkmen from the province and importing Arabs from the south to the province. Yeah. So that whole Arabization policy was to stop Kurds from controlling Kirkuk. Kurds have wanted to take control of Kirkuk for a long time, mm -hmm. partly it's because it's got a large Kurdish population, but partly because of the oil wealth. Yeah. In the old days, the Kurds didn't know that they had oil in their region. So control of Kirkuk was seen as very much necessary for the Kurds moving towards independence. Yeah. I was serving as an election advisor in Kirkuk uh, in, but then uh, they decided not to participate in the 2009 legislative elections, and so I moved to Baghdad province instead. But, uh, it's always contentious about who is eligible to vote in Kirkuk, hmm. and this goes back and forth, yeah. because since 2003, a lot of the new Arabs have been moved out, and a lot of Kurds have moved back, and so it's this whole contentious about who should vote there, yeah. and is it a vote of belonging to Kurdistan or not? And so this goes on. So the Kurds control Kukuk now. And now that it's a very you know, difficult time under the Islamic State in other areas, that people are not pushing back yet on Kurdish control. But you can imagine in the future, if Mosul is retaken, if Hawija is retaken, then there's going to be more talk about Kurdish control of Kukuk. Kukuk is disputed. It doesn't get resolved just by military force. It is still disputed. You know, one of the interesting things when you look at the Kurdish history of the last hundred years is that each time they've felt themselves in a position of power, they have tried for too much. They have pushed beyond what they could sustain politically, and they have suffered brutally and bloodily in the changes. When the political balance shift, they could never get a revolution going on both sides of the same border at the same time. Um, and I, th I wonder to myself if they're not again at one of these moments. They've got a lot of power now. They've pushed out their areas, what we used to call the Green Line. But most of the Green Line areas are not very defensible country. They're rather low rolling hills. They're not the mountains of Kurdistan. Um, They've got more Turkish support than they had before. Uh, Turkish policy has changed. But I, I, so far, they're not doing too badly. But I, I wonder if they are going to go through another of these periods where they, where they overextend themselves and pay a price. And there's always political competition between the different Kurdish groups. So Barzani's KDP, Talibani's PUK, now Goran, and now with the PKK is now active within the borders of Iraq as well. And so this competition, at the moment there's a common enemy in the Islamic State, but after that there's still all the competition between the different Kurdish groups. Please. Recently uh, the uh, Prime Minister al-Abadi came to, uh, to D.C. to meet with President Obama. I had a good feeling about him and that he's talking about uh, anti-sectarian and inclusiveness in government. What is your take on him and is he making progress? And this is, you know, when I go back to 2010 when people said there were no alternatives to Maliki, 
you don't know that because when you look at Haider Abadi, you think maybe if we'd upheld the election results in 2010, they might have come up with a compromise candidate like Haider Abadi then. So when you look at last year's elections, Maliki won last year's elections. But really, it was a letter from Ayatollah Sistani to the Dawa party saying, you need to replace Maliki. You need to replace him because he's taking the government, I mean, he's taking the country down. And so Dawa came up with a compromise candidate, Haider Abadi, even though Haider Abadi had won, I think, 5,000 personal votes. He's not a known name, but he was acceptable to the Iranians and also acceptable to the US. So I think with Haider Abadi, you've got somebody who's got the will, who's got the right ideas, but I don't think he's got the capacity to deliver. He's got enough problems within the state of law coalition. He's still got Maliki trying to get back into power. So he doesn't have his, a strong constituency yet. He's moderate in an environment in which extreme voices gain much more support. And so he's, I think he would like to do the right thing. I just think it's very, very difficult for him to do this. I think he's trying hard. I think he means well. But I don't feel there's any sort of knight in shining armor who's going to arrive and be the hero that makes everything better. We're always looking for that hero. It was Karzai, it was Maliki, and so it wasn't. And now it's Ashraf Ghani and Abadi, but they're constrained in what they can do. Um, I'd like to ask about decentralization. So you mentioned um, towards the end of your remarks about the need to devolve uh, further powers to the provinces. I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on the sorts of powers you think should be devolved from the central government, particularly in terms of uh, administrative uh, uh, governance and, and, and decentralization. I think a lot of this is actually set out in the provincial council law. So at the moment, the provincial councils, in theory, on the books, can have these powers. But a lot of the time, those powers aren't actually executed. I think it's very hard when you've got a center that is so weak at the moment. Non-state actors are stronger than state actors at the moment. So it's hard to push out. But I think a change in the electoral system, so you have people voted as representatives of these communities, could help bring that about and get much more local policing, locally recruited security forces, the army should be what can back them up. But when I look at that, what is hard is where we, how we get from where we are today to that. So I look at sort of the best optimistic future for Iraq is confederation and decentralization. But how to get there, I think, is difficult. What might happen in our current phase of militia warlordism is you might get more and more decentralization taking place anyway. How you then take that in to a state structure could be what happens next. And I can't think of places where this has happened before, but I think it's important there are places and look for other analogies to see how that might happen. I think that could create more stability. Pulling everything back to the center isn't going to work, but getting legitimate leaders locally is also difficult. Those at the center don't want to give up. And it's hard to find, it's hard to see people emerging at the local level. So good question, but I have not got good answers. Wait. This is Dia from Syria. Uh, if you were the advisor of Mr. Obama, now, what advice you have to avoid replicating the Iraqi experience in Syria? Thank you. As for Syria, you know, we've stood by while Assad mass murdered the Syrian people. How we have done that is partly because of what happened in Iraq, because we thought whatever we do, things just get worse. And you can look at what's happened in Syria and think, gosh, if we'd only done this then, or if we'd only done this then, Syria wouldn't be at the stage today. I don't think Syria would be in the state it is in today if things were better in Iraq. I think that has really destabilized things in Syria as well. Iraq has also made us very nervous about getting involved. So Syria is an absolute tragedy. I think the international community should be ashamed. I think we should all be ashamed of what's happened. And it goes on. And this, you know, half the Syrian people have been displaced. 200,000 have been killed. This doesn't end. This refugee crisis is going to go on. Half the population is displaced. 
it is a tragedy, and it doesn't end. It really doesn't end. And still there is no vision of how to bring stability to Syria. So, you know, I think that's an awfully important point as we draw to an end, is when you talk about policy goals, there has to be a vision of where you're going to arrive, not the it's not the military end state because politics never ends. But when we talk about Syria, there's a huge need to have a vision of how would you put a stable Syria together that it doesn't result in ethnic cleansing. And we don't have that in the policy. We have a policy about ISIS. We sort of have a policy about the rest of the opposition, kind of. We have no policy about how all the supporters of Assad are to figure into an eventual stabilization. Iraq, we have an anti-ISIS policy and sound bites about joining people together. And even in our popular discourse, leaving some mercy for poor Mr. Obama, um, you know, we talk constantly about what is the strategy. We've managed to meld the concepts of strategy and goals. Strategy is how you reach whatever goals you've decided on. But strategy is not where you set the goals themselves. The goals drive the strategy. And that has become a poverty-stricken public dialogue in the United States where we constantly say, what's your strategy for Syria without ever having bothered to say, what are the goals and do we agree on them? Uh, and that, of course, is a leitmotif of everything Emma has described in Iraq, is the constant improvisation of tactics without goals. Um, and so I think we have used up our time, and unless you want to get a last word in there, which we can do. Well, my last word, because I don't want to leave on a depressing note, but my last word is when you look at the history of this region, it is a history of peaceful coexistence. And we need to remind ourselves of that because it hasn't been characterized like Europe was by 30 years war of sectarian violence. People have coexisted in the past. Now, obviously, the levels of sectarianism are at new record highs. But it's important, particularly for the young people, to look back at their history, that sense of multicultural, multi-ethnic societies, and look at that as inspiration for the future. Because when I meet young people in the Middle East, they want to live in sorts of countries that look like Dubai, not Daesh. Islamic State does not give anybody a hopeful vision for the future. That's not what the majority of people want. And we must remember that when we think of what's going on in the region. That's a good note on which to close. Emma, we thank you and thank all of you for coming and for joining. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.